the circuit. Oh yay, oh yay, oh yay, all persons having any manner or form of business before the Honorable of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit are admonished to draw an eye and give their attention for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this honorable court. May be seated. Winograd. Thank you, Chief Judge Gregory, and may it please the court. Under federal regulations, asylum applicants who have been subjected to past persecution enjoy a presumption that they would also have a well-founded fear of future persecution. In this case, the board found that DHS rebutted that presumption by establishing that my client could relocate internally within Pakistan. We asked the court to vacate or reverse that determination for at least one of three reasons. First, instead of requiring DHS to show that my client could relocate within Pakistan, it placed the burden on my client to show that he could not relocate within Pakistan. Second, the board did not identify a specific area of Pakistan in which he could ostensibly relocate. Did you argue that uh, at the BIA level, the specific area argument? I'm not sure that argument was made, but I think that the board itself committed the error by saying that he could relocate in Pakistan or uh, or in, in Islamabad or elsewhere in Pakistan. So you are you saying you didn't need to to raise that at the BIA level for us to consider it now? Yes, yeah, so we think the board's decision itself raises that issue. And I would also note that the government did not raise uh, any exhaustion arguments. I know it is uh, jurisdictional in this circuit, but, but whether exhaustion is jurisdictional is presently before the Supreme Court. Um, and then third, we believe the board erred on the merits in finding that my client could relocate within Pakistan. And even if the court was inclined to uphold the board on the existing record, uh, evidence, evidence of which it may take judicial notice uh, demonstrates that the board's decision can no longer stand. So unless the court prefers otherwise, I will address the issues in that order. Uh, the first and most fundamental error in the board's decision was that it did not shift the burden to DHS to affirmatively establish that my client could relocate within Pakistan, despite stating that, my, that DHS satisfied its burden, its actual analysis shows that it placed the burden on my client to show that he could not relocate within Pakistan. The board began the passage in question by stating that my client's assertion that he could not safely relocate was not supported by the objective evidence in the record. Then, after discussing the evidence... The Didn't board the board... I, I think you already mentioned this, but the board did begin and end by articulating the correct um, presumption. Right. Correct, but its actual analysis shows that it did not actually did, that it did not uh, flip the burden. In fact, so after discussing the evidence before the the, the final sentence of that paragraph, it said uh, the record did not support my client's claim that he could not relocate in Pakistan. And then again, in the very next sentence, the board stated that my client had not shown that he would be unable to relocate in Pakistan. Now the government argues that the board did not fail to shift the burden because it upheld the IJ's decision and the IJ did not fail to shift the burden. But in fact, the IJ herself did fail to shift the burden. And as, as is made clear, this is on page 348 of the record, when she said immediately before issuing her oral decision, quote, I really think this case comes down to whether internal relocation is possible. And I'm not convinced that it is not possible in your case. Now, the government also claims that Counsel, the board... What, yes. what, if, what if we're satisfied, nonetheless, that the record supports the government's view of the evidence with respect to relocation? Does it matter that perhaps the standard was muddled um, uh, over the course of the two decisions? It, it does, Your Honor, um, for a few reasons. One, under the ordinary remand rule, when, when the agency uh, applies the wrong standard or the wrong burden, the, uh, the remedy is to remand for further consideration. And the only uh, exception to that principle uh, is very limited in cases where it would be unquestionably futile uh, to remand. Um, second, I would also note that in, in, in Mogavero, this court held that a general statement regarding the burden of proof cannot overcome an erroneous instruction as to how a party can satisfy its burden. So by analogy, if a judge told a criminal jury uh, that the prosecution had to establish its burden beyond a reasonable doubt, 
but that they should return a verdict of guilty unless the evidence affirmably proved the defendant was innocent, then that would clearly be grounds for reversal. And we think that would also be grounds for reversal in this case. Instead of asking whether DHS established whether my client could relocate, the board stated on three separate occasions that the record did not establish that he could not relocate. Uh, so by definition, we think the board failed to shift its burden. Now, this court has not confronted a similar question in an immigration case, but we think the facts of this case are materially indistinguishable from the Sixth Circuit's decision in Antonio versus Barr and the Ninth Circuit's decision in Afri versus Holder. And we relied on both cases in our opening brief, and the government does not mention them in their answering brief. So unless the government offers some basis to distinguish those cases today, uh, we think the court should presume that they are not distinguishable. Now, the, the second error in the board's decision was that it failed to identify a specific area of Pakistan where my client could ostensibly relocate. Now, the government claims somewhat contradictorily in our view, both that the board was not required to identify a specific area, but that it identified Islamabad as a specific area where he could relocate. But we think the government is mistaken on both counts. It, but the government did um, identify Islamabad on a couple of occasions, correct? But it was not, well, a few responses, Your Honor. One, it was not limited to Islamabad. It was, Islam, it was Islamabad or other areas in Pakistan. Second, we don't believe Islamabad is really even on the table as a possible area of relocation because under this court's precedent, my client was persecuted in Islamabad. And the regulations contemplate that a non-citizen has to relocate to another part of the country where they were not persecuted. Now, in terms of the, the, the underlying legal requirement, the board clearly stated in matter how was your client persecuted in islamabad oh because he received phone calls from the taliban that threatened him with death and under this court's precedent death threats even delivered by phone qualify as persecution um now in terms of the underlying legal requirement in mzmr the board clearly stated that when an asylum applicant was the victim of past persecution dhs must demonstrate quote that there is a specific area of the country where the applicant could relocate. Now that guidance is not only consistent uh, with guidance provided by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, but it is also consistent with the regulations themselves. The regulations say that when considering whether it would be reasonable for an asylum applicant to relocate, uh, adjudicators must consider whether the applicant would face other serious harm in the place of suggested relocation. Well, but the regulation itself talks about designating another part are you, are, are you saying that, that there really is no distinction there, that by, by indicating another part of the country where the petitioner could relocate, that the, that the uh, agency needs to be specific as to the place? Yes, because the regulations also subsequently refer to uh, the place of suggested relocation. So we think those regulations have to be read in harmony, um, because otherwise, uh, if, there was, if, there was, if a specific place uh, of relocation was not identified, it would be virtually impossible to conduct the reasonable, the reasonableness. Well, wouldn't analysis. it depend on the facts? I mean, if, if we're talking about a, and I know you don't concede that this is the, the point, if we're talking about, for example, a local gang that operated in one specific part of a country, one, one town or a province, uh, but there was no other evidence that the gang operated elsewhere, uh, wouldn't the government meet its burden by simply showing generally that the petitioner could relocate to those other parts of the country without designating a specific place? Well, we, we don't think that would be consistent with the regulations for the reasons I mentioned. But even in that scenario, the government could simply then identify one specific place in the rest of the country in order to satisfy its burden. Because as, as we, we recognize that the, that the Ninth Circuit has not adopted our approach, but the Ninth Circuit did say that even if the government can propose a more general area, that the government has to show that the entirety of the area is safe for relocation. So. If the suggested place of relocation in this case is simply anywhere outside the former tribal area, that would also include the city of Peshawar, where my client was undoubtedly persecuted and where the, the Taliban left a note for him outside his brother's home. And it would also include the many parts of Pakistan that are completely uninhabitable. So even if this court adopts the Ninth Circuit's approach, we think that would not help the government on the facts of this specific case. Now, to the extent that the government argues that uh, Islamabad was identified as a specific area of relocation, uh, we think it is also incorrect. Um, in finding that my client could relocate within Pakistan, the board noted that he had 10 siblings 
who lived in different areas of Pakistan. And my client testified, this is on page 343 of the record, that none of his siblings live in Islamabad. So the board could not have simultaneously identified Islamabad as a specific area of relocation when it suggested that he could live with any one of his siblings, none of whom actually live in Islamabad. What's the, what's the record evidence as to the, the reach of the Taliban uh, within Pakistan generally? Um, in, in the administrative record, uh, certainly in the, uh, in the province in which my client, the, the Fata itself no longer exists, but in the province in which it was assumed is its, uh, 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 a is its base. But certainly uh, the Taliban has carried out terrorist attacks in other parts of the country. And to the extent there is an, any ambiguity in the record, it is, it is the government's burden to show that the Taliban does not have reach uh, throughout the country. But that really gets to the merits. Um, and, and on the merits, the question is not simply whether uh, the Taliban would, would successfully locate my client elsewhere in the country. The question is whether my client would have a well-founded fear of persecution anywhere else in the country. And, and as I mentioned, under this court's precedent, uh, a death threat delivered by phone qualifies as persecution. Now, on the merits, um, if the court does reach the merits, we would, we would ask it to, to reverse uh, the board's decision. We argue in our briefs that that inquiry is subject to de novo review. Um, but this court does not need to reach what the correct standard of review Can is. Can I ask a question yes. about that? So if we reach the, the merits, is it your view that, that uh, a reasonable adjudicator could come to a different conclusion other than that your client faced a reasonable uh, fear of persecution on this record? Or, I mean, you, you don't ask for um, a remedy from us. You're asking for a remand for the agency to, to do it again so that we can we can come back here again and make the same argument no, no certainly not your honor if the court reaches the merits and even if it applies even if it applies substantial evidence review we would ask it to hold that no reasonable adjudicator could find that dhs established that my that there was a part of pakistan in which my client would not have a well-founded fear of persecution and we think that is so for four reasons so we don't have to accept your de novo standard of review in order to rule in your favor is that what you're arguing precisely your honor precisely so e even under substantial evidence review we think for four related reasons no reasonable adjudicator could find that there is a part of pakistan in which my client would not have a well-founded fear the first is that my client fears being persecuted by the taliban itself which is a designated terrorist organization that has already killed more than thirty thousand pakistanis Second, the Taliban already attempted to kill him on one prior occasion and sent him a note saying that only death could spare him. Third, the individuals who wish to harm my client already attempted to track him down elsewhere in Pakistan and promised to find him, quote, wherever he went. And fourth, as I've mentioned, persecution does not require physical harm under this court's precedent or even face-to-face -face contact. A simple death threat would suffice. So your honors, if so, ask, so a yes. death threat in the abstract without any real ability to carry it out would suffice? I mean, that's not this case. I know you argue, mm -hmm. but I mean, we have to have something more than simply a threat, right? Well, this court has said, said very clearly that a, a death threat qualifies as persecution. In which case? Yes. Well, certainly Portillo Flores and, and many other cases where they said- No, I don't dispute yes. that, but then yeah. the question is, in terms of a reasonable fear of persecution, mm -hmm. if that threat is meaningless, because for example, the persecutor is behind bars for the rest of his life. Or um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's gotta be some realistic possibility of the threat being carried out. Or Certainly, or if, okay. if there was no realistic possibility of being carried out, then yes, there could potentially be an exception to this court's rule. But in this case, we're dealing with the Taliban and that's clearly not the case. So so the question, um, you know, even though my client does fear that he would be killed in, in uh, Pakistan, that's not the question before the court. The question is whether any reasonable person in his uh, position would not fear even being threatened with death, or put differently, whether DHS established that no person in my client's position uh, would fear being threatened with death somewhere in Pakistan. And we don't believe that DHS met its burden. But even if DHS did meet its burden with regard to the safe relocation prong, it did not meet its burden with regard to the reasonable relocation prong. Um, and we know this from the IJ's oral decision itself. The IJ found that it would not be unreasonable to expect my client to relocate within Pakistan because he would face the same general risk of violence as the rest of the population. But that observation does not mean what the immigration judge apparently thought it meant, 
while it is true that a generalized risk of violence may not be sufficient to establish a fear of persecution on account of a protected ground, when an asylum applicant has already been subject to past persecution on account of a protected ground, as my client indisputably, indisputably was, a countrywide risk of generalized violence only shows that it would not be reasonable to expect him or her to relocate to another part of the country. So the IJ's decision in this respect was self-contradictory. And given that the, IJ's, the IJ herself found that my client would face a generalized risk of violence elsewhere in the country, we believe it simply does not matter whether he would be able to find employment or, or live with one of his siblings in another part of the country. Thank you, Mr. Winograd. Mr. Phelps, sir. Good morning, Your Honors. Counsel, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Mm -hmm. yes. May it please the court. Rob Stalzer on behalf of the AG. Your Honors, asylum is reserved for applicants who cannot avail themselves of safety of their home country anywhere in their country. And that's why the regulations focus on whether relocation is a possibility and whether it would be reasonable for the applicant under all the circumstances to relocate. Those are circumstance-specific questions uh, that the board and the immigration judge uh, found in this case, affirmatively found uh, that he could relocate. I know- uh, my Is there anything in this record that would suggest or support the idea that the Taliban uh, has any place in Pakistan that it can't reach? In this record, is there any evidence that there's any place in Pakistan that Taliban does not have the reach? I don't believe so, Your Honor, but that's not, because that's a hypothetical. That's, not, that's, that's a hypothetical? Well, we're saying, could they get anywhere? Yes, a person could go anywhere in Pakistan, the Taliban especially, because they do have the resources to move within the country. And so aren't we talking about finding a place where he's supposed to be able to relocate? Yes, Your Honor, under all the circumstances. And one of those circumstances is that the Taliban is present in Pakistan. But other of the circumstances are the factors that the regulations say the immigration judge must consider. And based on the factors here, where could he possibly relocate in Pakistan? All right, the immigration judge and the board identified two possibilities. One Islamabad and one outside of the Taliban controlled areas, the former Fatah. Just anywhere outside, outside. Where, would that, where would that be? Based on what you your answer to Chief Judge Gregory just now. For example, um, petitioner testified that his family had relocated away from uh, the Khyber agency to get away from uh, their antagonist and had done so successfully. And then I believe he also testified that some of his sisters had also married and moved even further out. But this is not a case where we're talking about a, a group, a protected group of family situations. We're talking about because of assistance to America. That's that's different. If, if, I mean, if it was saying based on my family, and you could say, "Oh, your family is doing well here, here." But this is not this case, is it? This is just this is not family. Related. That is one factor to consider, Your Honor, under the regulations. But it's, a, but it's a fact to be considered. But the facts of this case would make it a very small consideration here. They would say, "I'm after you because what you have done to assist the United States." So your family members being around uh, those locations wouldn't be safe for him, would it? I mean, under these facts, I'm talking about under these facts, I don't tell about some ethereal aspect of it, but these facts, in this case, how, how do you equate that? Because there was no evidence, Chief Judge, that they would find him or could find him in any of those areas. Wait, the only time he lived with a family member, he lived with his brother and the Taliban found him there and he had to leave. They left the letter, yes, Your Honor. So, so what happened? Oh, so right, that was in Peshawar, not Islamabad. Well, that's the only time he lived with a family member, and that didn't work. So, so I don't see how it's reasonable to think that he could just live with some unnamed family member in some unnamed place and be safe. Because of his age, his educational statistics, or excuse me, his educational characteristics, because Islamabad is a city of a million people, and there was no evidence that they could follow him there or find him. Right, the only time, and he testified to this. They continued to threaten him when, uh, for the only three to four weeks he was in Islamabad, correct? Over his cell phone. He never had an in-person confrontation. Did you have to have an in-person confrontation? And perhaps one of the reasons they didn't have an in-person com confrontation is because he also testified he stayed inside the entire time he was in Islamabad. Is the government arguing that he must live in hiding the rest of his life? No, Your Honor, we're not arguing that. 
uh, to answer your first question, uh, yes, it is persecutory to receive death threats over, over a cell phone, not just a personal confrontation. But the point or the thrust of the immigration judge's factual findings on this point is that uh, he was on the same cell phone he had, they already had. And there was no evidence that they could ever find him without that cell phone. Can I ask you that? So this gets to Mr. Uh, your, your colleague on the other side's question about the burden. You keep saying there was no evidence that they could find them, but the, the, the question, the burden is on the government to show that there was that 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 there was evidence. There was the record supports the notion that they couldn't find them, not that they could find them. I mean, isn't that inverting the burden? Uh, I, th I think it's an assessment of the evidence as a whole. This is one of the characteristics or the circumstances that has to be taken into account as to whether he can relocate. Once he's outside of the Fatah, once he's outside of Peshawar in Islamabad or another area of the country where the Taliban is, does not have control, because that's what the immigration judge said, whether they could or would find him. Well, why is control? I mean, control certainly is not irrelevant, but that doesn't mean, as the chief indicated, you, you conceded that apparently the Taliban can reach anywhere in the country. So. At that point, it's incumbent upon the government to show that they couldn't find him in, in a specific place. And the government didn't present any evidence, right? No, Your Honor. The government relied on the documentary evidence of record and petitioner's own testimony to conclude that he could reasonably relocate. And, and what is the strongest piece of petitioner's own testimony um, that would demonstrate that he could successfully and safely relocate. I would say the fact that the family continues to reside safely in Pakistan. But the, the Taliban, the, the, those family members are in a bit of a different position, right? Because they, as best I could tell, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. He was the one who personally insulted uh, the leader of uh, the local leader, I guess, and received the sort of the death warrant that the others did not. Does that change the calculus? I'd say they are in a similar position for the reason this was a family business. And after Petitioner left, they continued the family business and then the Taliban destroyed it. And that's why they moved out of Khyber uh, district was or Khyber agency was because they couldn't stay there anymore. But the Taliban apparently hasn't followed them, hasn't sought, out, sought them out. They continue to reside safely in Pakistan. So to answer Judge Thetford's question, what would be the strongest evidence? I think that is the strongest piece of evidence in conjunction with the other factors that the immigration judge considered. Because, of course, the standard is in all the circumstances, whether it would be reasonable to expect if there's any place in uh, Pakistan that he could live uh, safely from the... Do you agree with opposing counsel that the government needed to identify a specific location where he could reside safely? I'm glad, I'm glad you asked that, Your Honor. And the answer is uh, they didn't have to name a specific a neighborhood or a specific city or a specific province. They had to point out where he couldn't go or shouldn't go. Uh, and based on and what is your evidence. okay what is your authority for that MZM, because he has authority for yes, MZMR his position. itself used the language the specific area but the specific area in MZR, right. MZRM was outside his home village in other words in MZRM itself which used the word specific area they thought it sufficient to say outside the area of danger uh, and that was echoing the first circuit in Tendian against Gonzalez and of course, the Ninth Circuit most recently confronted that uh, issue in Singh against Whitaker and agreed that it is enough to simply say outside of the area of danger, uh, not specifically identify a province. The entire country here is an area of danger. So we don't know that. That's conjecture. Lee, I thought you case. conceded that. I conceded in that response the Taliban to, I'm, I'm, can, Apologize. For um, I thought you conceded that in response to Chief Judge Gregory's question, the I very guess, first question. The very first question was whether the Taliban could reach anywhere in Pakistan. You said yes. Yes. That doesn't mean they can kill him or hurt him anywhere in Pakistan. I don't know what they can do everywhere But in you do know that their intent toward him is animus. Yes, Your Honor. Animus intent and broad and complete reach. How does that not equate to a reasonable person fearing their life wherever they are in Pakistan? Because it's speculative. Well, well look, they, they beat him up. <laughs> They they shot at him uh, and his brother. They sent death threats. They they told him they would find him anywhere and kill him. So how is that? Yes, they did those things to him in Fatah, where they could find him. They said they would find him anywhere he went and kill him. Right. So in order for the government to have proof that he could not safely relocate, they need to find him and kill him. <laughs> uh, that that sounds a, a little bit like what you're arguing. 
Oh, I apologize, Your Honor. That he I, must, my, or he must live in hiding the rest of his life. Right. I don't believe that's the case. I think the evidence here establishes that he could reside safely somewhere else, even though the Taliban at one time were looking for him because there wasn't evidence that they could find him in a city like, for example, Islamabad of a million people. Uh, they only found him when he left, and he testified to this, right? He's, he was asked if he had ever been confronted by the Taliban outside of the, the Fatah, and he said no. And the reason for that was because the only way they could find him in Islamabad was because he was using the same cell phone number. He stayed inside the entire time he was in Islamabad. That's perhaps another reason they couldn't find him in Islamabad. We don't know that. Right. We only but know that. it's the government's burden to come. Do you agree it's the government's burden? It is the government's burden. Come forward with some sort of affirmative. Agree. Yes. Okay. Uh, Just a bit of housekeeping regarding the supplemental State Department report. I just wanted to, um, as I did in my motion, urge the court to uh, to reject that as a supplemental filing. Neither the immigration judge nor the board could rely on it, and so it didn't serve as a basis of either of their decisions and shouldn't be under review here. Uh, to return to the merits, um, the two prongs, right, whether he could relocate, and for there the, the question was, again, his family managed to relocate. Um, uh, the his encounters with the Taliban only occurred in the Fatah region, in-person encounters, I should say. And then, of course, on the second sprung, whether under the circumstances it's reasonable to do so, right, this was the board and the immigration judge were required to address the factors about his personal circumstances, including his age, his educational status, social status. I think the immigration judge mentioned his maturity and resourcefulness um, and the ability to relocate. And then there, too, is his family support structure, because he does have the family restore a family support structure in the country uh, to help him. And that is why it would be reasonable to expect him to relocate on the merits, Your Honors. And what assistance would they give him to protect him from the Taliban? We're not talking about food and shelter. So tell me what protection would they give him? Well, I imagine. Uh, you no, know, imagine. I'm using your words. He has family that can give him protection. Tell me what protection his family could give him from the Taliban. Because don't say food and shelter and love and respect. I'm sure you get that from any like family member. But what protects them they can give from the Taliban? Uh, infrastructure. Infrastructure, man, a home? Yes, Your Honor. What's your position on the standard of review? I believe uh, the board, of course, reviews this for clear error, suggesting we're talking about factual questions. In the past, this court has reviewed it for substantial evidence, again, because we're talking about factual questions. Uh, I agree with that prior precedent, and I think that, that the board appropriately applied clear error review here, and that your review here is for substantial evidence. The reason for that is because we're talking about a circumstance-specific inquiry. This isn't an inquiry that admits of broad legal generalizations, which is what we normally think of when we think of de novo review the court issuing a, a legal principle that the immigration judges and the board can then apply and say, no, the court just told us this is how we have to do this. Instead, we're looking at a um, circumstance, this is a case specific uh, fact finding, which is why I think that the court should continue to employ these substantial evidence uh, standard of review. So um, the, the, the government in the hearing before the immigration judge focused on the three to four week window, which during which the petitioner was able to um, remain in Islamabad, albeit in hiding, as he testified. Um, and he received the call from the Taliban, and, and you say the government says, well, that's because he didn't change his cell phone number. But put that aside for the moment. I mean, isn't that just too short of a window to sort of figure out whether or not the petitioner in this case could actually avoid persecution? The standard is whether he can reasonably avoid persecution for the rest of his or her life, right? And I guess we get back to the burden. The government had the burden to present evidence to support that notion. And I I think you can tell by our questions, we're kind of struggling to see that evidence in the record. So what is the strongest piece of evidence that the petitioner could avoid persecution for the rest of his, his or her life? Uh, again, like I said, because the family safely resides in the country. Um, as long as, again, outside of the Taliban controlled areas. And where in the record is the indication that the family safely resides in the country? 
Uh, I think petitioner testified to that, but I don't have a record site for you up here. Your petitioner also testified that his brother had been shot at, correct? Yes, his brother was in the car when they were shot at inside the Fatah. Or the and Fatah. the brother was actually hit. Yeah, he, they, all three of them were injured, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. um, but that was when they were inside the Fatah and while the business was still operating. For reasons I've stated, I've urged the court to deny the petition for review. Um, I hear you. If you have any other questions, Your Honors. Thank you, Mr. Stout. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Mr. Winograd, anything further? <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, I would like to start by incorporating uh, Chief Judge Gregory's uh, opening question to my colleague uh, as my answer to Judge Diaz's original question. Um, the question is whether the record shows that whether there is any evidence that there is a part of Pakistan that the Taliban cannot reach. And that is also consistent with guidance from the UN itself, which we uh, cite on page 46 of our brief, um, which, which says that when considering whether a non-citizen could avoid a non-state persecutor through internal relocation, it is not sufficient simply to find that the original agent of persecution has not yet established a presence in the proposed area. Now, with regard to my client's family, uh, we, we find that simply not material to this case. The grievance is personal. Um, the, I did not try this case before the immigration judge. My recollection is not that the Taliban destroyed the business, but the family voluntarily closed, closed down the business. And in fact, the Taliban did personally confront my client's family while he was in hiding in Islamabad. Um, and they, they, they did not harm any members of my client's family other than grabbing his father's beard uh, which was a, a grave insult, but not one that we would contend rises to the level of persecution. Um, now, in addition- So then I, is opposing counsel correct that um, the rest of his family is able to safely reside in Pakistan? There isn't any evidence either way other than what I just mentioned, but even assuming that other members of his family can safely reside in Pakistan, that makes no difference to my client, because as I said, the grievance is personal. And I, I just wanted to remind the court of my client's exact testimony regarding the phone calls he received while he was in Islamabad. Um, and this is on page 332 of the record. Question, the phone calls you received in Islamabad after fleeing Peshawar, do you remember what the Taliban said to you? Answer, they were repeating the same things, that you are a traitor and you were supporting and helping America. And there is only one solution to get rid of traitors, that they should be killed and we would not spare any traitor and that they would kill the traitors. Question, did they, ever t did they ever tell whether they knew where you were after you fled to Islamabad? Answer, they were saying repeatedly that wherever you go, we can locate you and we would not spare you, that we would kill you. So your honors, given this credible testimony, we think no reasonable adjudicator could find that any reasonable person in my client's position uh, would not have a well-founded fear of persecution anywhere in Pakistan. And this goes to, to Judge Diaz's question about the timing. Um, as this court said in, in Ortez Cruz, the question is not whether the Taliban would immediately threaten or find him in Pakistan. The question is whether they would do so at any point in his life. And, and threats like the kind I mentioned don't come with a statute of limitations. So long as the Taliban continues to exist, a reasonable person in my client's position would fear being threatened with death by them. Um, finally, just with regard to the standard of review, the board actually applies de novo review um, to whether a fear of persecution is objectively reasonable. It held that specifically in matter of ZZO, which is a case we cite in our briefs. Um, now in matter of MZMR, it didn't specifically address the standard of review, but it did remand the record for the immigration judge to make both factual and legal conclusions. So we think that also suggests that the board would apply de novo review uh, to the individual inquiries of the relocation analysis. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you both, Council. Appreciate your arguments. Uh, we're going to come down Greek Council, and after that, we'll proceed to our next case. All rise.
The case of Jacob Ross took place in the heart of the COVID-19 pandemic, March of 2021. At the time, the court in this case allowed, in fact required, participants to be masked, including the defendant, Mr. Ross. This case raises a very unique issue regarding the identification of the defendant by a government witness, Ms. Sasha Peters. At trial, the government called Ms. Peters as a key witness to its case against Mr. Ross regarding his, his charges of manufacturing child pornography. The government called Ms. Peters, she got on the witness stand, and she was asked, could she identify Mr. Ross? At the time, he was still wearing his mask and was seated at defense table. Ms. Peters, on two occasions, said no. Essentially, she could not identify Mr. Ross. Counsel for the government then asked the court to instruct the defendant to take down his mask in an effort to assist Ms. Peters in trying to make this identification. And he used Ms. his name, right? He did. I mean, the court used the defendant's name. He, he called, he told Mr. Ross, please take down your mask. Was there anything wrong with him asking the defendant to take down the mask? With the, putting aside the fact that he called him out by name. I think it would have been more appropriate had he just said the defendant, will the defendant take down his mask? That's the procedure that the court seemed to engage in with prior witnesses. The distinction being that prior witnesses were able to initially identify the defendant with his mask on, whether by pointing at him at counsel table, identifying articles of clothing. And at that point, government counsel would ask the court to instruct the defendant to pull down his mask to confirm the identification with the mask down. So can I, so this, this, I, I get your argument, but this case doesn't strike me as the kind of classic eyewitness identification case where you've got somebody who sees a defendant for, for a moment. Uh, the classic example is a bank teller sees a bank robbery suspect, uh, and then the suspect runs out and then he or she is asked to make it an identification. In this case, Ms. Peters apparently had a long standing or a relationship, uh, a personal, uh, relationship with the defendant knew him for, for a good bit of time. So, I mean, this, these factors that, that we take into account with respect to identification, do they really apply in this context, given the fact that it doesn't appear to be in dispute that she actually knew him? Well, we had argued they don't apply because of the very unique nature of what occurred when the court told Mr. Ross to pull down his mask. It's not at this point an impermissibly suggested identification procedure. It's in fact the court stepping in and identifying Mr. Ross. Did defense counsel object? Did not, Your Honor. So how is this not um, harmless? Part of the reason the weight of the other evidence and I didn't four other witnesses identify him during the trial. They did your honor. And three of those before Ms. Peters testified, correct? That's correct. So how is this incident prejudicial? Two responses. First, it's why we're arguing to you that it's structural error, that the harmless error or plain error review is not necessary given the nature of this particular error that is a unique error that is goes to the fundamental nature nature of a criminal trial the government has the burden of proof the government must put forth evidence from the witness stand and in this case the court the trial court in fact identified mr ross for the witness just to make sure i'm clear I, the defense counsel did not object at that point correct, correct? did defense counsel ever raise it at any point after that in the trial or ask for an instruction on the issue or any anything? No, Your Honor. I, what I would say in, in defense of defense counsel is it, I think this procedure had been taking place on prior witnesses, again, acknowledging it's a unique circumstance where the court is dealing with masks. The problem with Ms. Peters' testimony is she could not do any identification of Mr. Ross at counsel table, despite the fact that he is sitting with defense counsel as the other witnesses did. And so for the court then to tell, quote, Mr. Ross, pull down your mask without any indication 
that Ms. Peters could, that she could otherwise identify him causes the problem that we're raising. And I acknowledge that the evidence indicates that she had a one month romantic relationship with him, with Mr. Ross, where they're essentially living together. The problem is when asked if she could, I mean, yeah, you would think him, she could have identified him then. Correct. Correct. And, and this is a fundamental witness to the government's case. Counsel for the government in her opening statement referred specifically to Ms. Peters testimony. And so the jury, when they hear her being called to the stand is anticipating a witness that they have heard forecast resided with Mr. Ross and engaged mm -hmm. in the specific offense conduct that he's charged with along with other offense conduct. And so to then have the court intervene and assist the government by identifying Mr. Ross for the witness, not only does it create a due process problem for my client, it shifts the burden off the government, but it also removed a potentially powerful argument for defense counsel. Had the government not been able to establish that Ms. Peters could identify Mr. Ross and remove her from the witness stand, defense counsel is now able to argue that to the jury. And by the court stepping in in this way and identifying Mr. Ross for Ms. Peters and for the government, it removes that argument from well, defense counsel. But even if we can see that the initial um, sort of identification procedure may have been unduly suggestive, then we sort of get to the, the five-step uh, uh, test in, in Biggers. And when you go through that analysis, it just seems to me that given this unique circumstance where you had, as you can see, a witness who knew the defendant for over a month they were in a romantic relationship. If you tick through those factors, it seems that any any issue with respect to suggestiveness on the front end is dissipated by the fact that most of those factors favor the government. Don't you agree? I agree, Your Honor. If the court determines that the Biggers impermissibly suggestive analysis is appropriate on these facts, then to the point you made, those factors, I would say, weigh in favor of the government, and we're back to a plain error analysis. So what we're arguing to you is because of exactly what happened in this trial, where it's not you know, law enforcement engaged in some free trial impermissibly suggestive mechanism for identification, or it's not even argument at, at, by defense counsel or, or us on appeal that something about the nature of where the defendant was seated caused impermissible suggestiveness. The court, in fact, identified Mr. Ross. It wasn't, it wasn't Ms. Peters that did the identification. It was the court by saying, Mr. Ross, take down your mask. In fact, it did the identification. So it's not impermissibly suggested. It's in fact, the court essentially offering evidence on behalf of the government. That's the distinction we're drawing and why we are arguing to you that it's structural error and not plain error. I mean, but you don't have any case that supports that 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 the fact that this is structural error? No, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, this is a unique, very specific So scenario. you want us to be the first to say that? Uh, that's what we're arguing to, yes. Your Honor. But I do think if you, if you take this for our argument that it is the court assisting the government by identifying the defendant, then it does go to the fundamental nature of criminal trials, where not just my client demands that the government bear the burden, but the public, in order to have trust in the outcome of criminal cases, has to rely on the fact that the government has to put forth evidence, that the government has to convince the jury beyond reasonable doubt based on that evidence. And when the court in this case makes an error of assisting the government by identifying Mr. Ross for the witness, it skews the fundamental nature of a criminal trial. And so that's why we're arguing to you that it is structural error. Now, Mr. Willis, uh I think you well conceded that you need this uh, structural error to prevail. Uh, plain error won't do it for you. Um, you're in a tough place, the Fourth Circuit, for that. Uh, I've tried my before. Before, <laughs> very difficult. Even when we leave out elements, and uh, you know, the Supreme Court said uh, that's not structural. You know, Ray Ayes cases where it's in, found to be a, an element to be proven is not given but, but what i'm asking you is this doesn't this really go to the weight of it uh, for example 
you know, I did a lot of trial defense work in my private practice. Wouldn't you be able to argue here? You know, you didn't object. You said, look at that. She couldn't identify. The judge had to just tell her who he was. My question is this, how is that structural? Doesn't it really go to the weight of it? You could have easily argued that. No, not you, whatever. We could have argued that to the, to the, to the jury. I mean, I love talking to the jury. I said, listen, person for a whole month, she had a whatever relationship with him. Couldn't do it. Judge had to drag the ass. Matter of fact, before that, tell him, that's him, that's his name. Now, that's him. Now, can you identify? Those kind of things. Doesn't that go to the weight? the weight of this in, in the sense because you you know you, you can't sandbag the court in the sense that now you come here and say it was a horrible structural error but you didn't take advantage of the opportunities in trial as to that interference if you will as you call it inst you know instigating themselves into the trial isn't that, isn't that kind of what we are here now i take your point your honor i think where i would try to draw a distinction is the fact that had the trial court not identified Mr. Ross, there's there's no further testimony from Ms. Peters. It's not that defense counsel now has to spend time cross-examining her. It's that she can't make the identification. Therefore, there's no further evidence from her. And so but that I mean, aren't you kind of speculating if, if he had not, if he had said, will the defendant take down the mask or will uh, or just nodded over to the defense counsel table. We don't know what she would have said, do we? We don't know, but it, we do know from two prior attempts that she was unable to identify him. And there's no indication in the record that she would have been able to identify him, but for the court telling Mr. Ross to, to remove his mask. Do you equate this with a sunglass situation where someone comes up to the stand with sunglasses on and and, and the person comes in? The judge says, take those sunglasses off. Would, would that be a problem? Or do you think the only problem is that he said who he was before that? You don't, you don't quibble with the mask coming down. Right? No, you're not. You're good with that. No, you're not. It's just that saying, this is Mr. X, and that's him. Now, do you know? Almost like, can you identify him? Right. That's your, the problem. Yes, Your Honor. I think the, the context of, with this specific witness who hasn't been able to offer any identification, unlike the other witnesses at trial where they were using this procedure where they would say he's wearing a suit, he's seated at counsel table, and then right. what I anticipate is out of an abundance of caution, government counsel asked that his mask be removed so that, in fact, the witness can identify him without a mask. Here we have no indicia from the witness that she has any ability to identify him. Your time is running out. So I have, I have one last question. I yes, sir. my colleagues can ask what they will, but one question to you. What, let's say she did what you would hope she would do. I don't know who it is. I can't identify the person. And she goes away. Tell me which offense would then be clearly off the board for your client. In other words, take her out of the equation. Which ones you would say, oh, without her, this one couldn't be proved. There's no evidence. Tell me which 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 offense is that? That she would relied solely on her being able to identify him. There's not an offense that, that right. the government relied solely on her. That's what I thought. I mean, that, I, that's a problem, isn't it? it? It is a problem if we're in the harmless error zone. I agree. But I would point out that her testimony directly linked the phone that trial counsel was arguing we had access to other people at this company you know, her testimony was the i observed him with the phone i was with him when he did these things to manufacture child pornography so i think her testimony was critical to the government's case it also involved other 412 conduct they clearly would have had an influence not only the jury but potentially the court at sentencing so I don't know that it's as easy as saying we can completely cut Ms. Peter's testimony out and know how the jury would have found, particularly when you're, when, as I argued earlier, defense counsel is now doesn't have this argument that the government called this witness and she, she couldn't identify him at all. And you heard her at openings, you heard the government at opening statement forecast this evidence. 
Well, you didn't get to, I, I took up some of your time. So you want to get to the sentencing aspect of it? Yeah, I, I don't need to be heard further on the sentencing aspect, Your Honor. I think it's fully briefed. Are you okay with that? All yes, right. Thank, Thank you, you, counsel. Mr. Enright. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Anthony Enright for the United States. The district court did not plainly err by allowing Sosha Peters to identify Ross after instructing him to remove his mask. Um, the plain error standard applies, the plain error standard applies even to structural errors, but this isn't a structural error under this court's precedent in Green, its recent decision in Ivy. What if we find it is structural error? If you find it structural error, Your Honor, there's four, there's three components of the plain error standard that still apply. You still have to find that there's an error. You still have to find that it's plain, which means it's beyond reasonable dispute. And I think I heard defense counsel say this is really a very unique situation. There is nothing it will arguably it's unique because a, a, a court has not identified for a witness the defendant before. That's that, what made it unique. The court helped the government and the witness by identifying the witness, I mean the defendant, in front of the jury. How does that not uh, impact the fairness of the trial? Well, Your Honor, because ultimately the, the fairness of the trial focuses on, on on whether the adversarial process is working. And to, to Judge Gregory's point or, or a discussion he had at least, the jury saw that. And and the weight of an identification. The, the jury saw what? The jury saw what transpired. The jury saw the court mention Mr. Ross's name before taking down his mask. The court evaluated the defend the witness's demeanor when the witness identified him, pointed at him and said, Yes, I'm sure. And ultimately, it's for the jury to decide whether that is a an identification worthy of credit. That's what the Supreme Court has identified when it has applied the standard, which is, in the court's words, a check on law a due process check on law enforcement identification. And I think that's an important point because the defend or, or because Ross, in his brief, cited the Simmons decision by the Supreme Court for this principle, which is the 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 Biggers and Braithwaite factors that line of decisions that the court addressed in Perry. That due process check applies only to show-ups or identifications arranged by law enforcement. That's not to say there's no limits on what a district court can do, but the defendant has not raised any. He, he identifies a couple other decisions about what happens when a witness has contact with a jury outside of the courtroom. But do you know of any other cases where the court has identified the defendant in front of the jury when the witness could not? Not like this, Your Honor, no. I don't think the court... That might be why opposing counsel hasn't found any any precedent. Well, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting he would need precedent, but he's there are rules other than the due process check that he identified uh, that govern... Um, uh, statements by the court. Uh, for example, Rule 605 says the court can't be a witness. But those weren't raised. I do think this specific issue raised by the defendant is one that applies only to law enforcement. But even if that framework applies to the court, either directly or by analogy, I, I don't think it warrants reversal under any standard here. I don't think there's an error that I know there wasn't a specific instruction given to the jury on this at the time it happened, but do you know whether or not the court, you know, at the end when the court was giving general instructions said that thing about anything I may have said is not evidence. Do you know whether that was given? Your Honor, I'm not, I, to be candid, I'm not 100% sure. I want to say I think so, but I argued four cases in the last few weeks. It might have been in another case. I apologize, but I don't want to answer. Well, opposing counsel says that uh, Ms. Peters was really fundamental to the government's case, and then that's uh, part of the problem here. What's your response to that? I'm not going to say she wasn't important, but she, everything she said was corroborated. Angela Peter, or Angela Carpenter, who was another witness, um, also testified that the same MO, she put the, uh, he had his phone, and he projected it on the screen and produced images of child pornography with a woman overseas who he had molest infants. She testified that too, much like um, 
much like Sasha Peters. And I want to emphasize that even without the identification, there's ample circumstantial evidence that the person who uh, Sasha Peters had experience with was Ross. For example, Angela Carpenter testified that she saw Sasha Peters at his apartment, and Sasha Peters testified, I saw Angela Carpenter did. She described the apartment in detail in a way that's Angela Carpenter corroborated, and it's consistent with um, the images of the apartment shown to the jury. Uh, he spoke to Sasha Peters about a dungeon where he kept young children. Um, unfortunately, other witnesses corroborated that. Angela Carpenter, and in his own uh, statement to law enforcement that the officer saw, he said, you'll never find the dungeon. That, that, that's all circumstantial evidence that they're talking about the same person, even independently of the identification. And because, uh, to, to a point Judge Diaz was discussing, because Miss Carpenter or Miss Peters had an intimate live-in relationship with Ross for uh, a month, there's no reasonable probability that she wouldn't have identified him under different circumstances had the court not said, uh, not mentioned his name before instructing him to remove the mask. And even if that's considered an impermissibly suggestive identification, this court can say with confidence that it was nonetheless reliable because of that. The opportunity to, to view was extraordinary. Yes, she's, she's a drug user, but she testified with details that were corroborated again and again, both by the information they found on his phone, which another thing linking it, linking that phone to him was that they found it in his pocket and he provided the passcode for it. And they found 28 images of child pornography, most of which he produced on that phone in his pocket. But that's basically three different reasons why this error would be harmless or not, not, not prejudicial very likely that the defendant, very likely that the witness would have identified the defendant in any event. There's very strong circumstantial evidence of his identity. And there's very strong other evidence, even if you were to discount Sasha Peters entirely, that overwhelmingly establish the offenses. Uh, Mr. Enright, let me ask this question. Obviously, it's a hypothetical, but I ask because no one has been able to identify, and perhaps as as, as uh, Judge Thacker said, as uh, the courts never do this. But what if uh, the judge had said, uh, and she said, she, no, I can't identify the person, and he said, it doesn't matter, you don't need to identify, just tell what the person did that you encountered. What would we do to a case like that? Well, I... It, I, I think it depends on what he, what she said. If she said, that's not the guy, I think we'd have a tough time proceeding with the witness. No, in my hypo, she didn't say, she never said, you know, I just can't identify. She didn't exclude him. Just, I can't say that's him. And you, and to this, so it doesn't matter. You just testify as to what the person did, you know, and you, you went on with the trial. Will we get to... Structural there. I'm just trying to find where where would we get to this place where the court, an appellate court, could say something went horribly wrong and something that counsel that the defendant was entitled to structurally or whatever. Do you think what do we get close to that line or where would we be there? Well, I don't think I don't think it would change it to a structural error simply because this court has said that identification of or the, I'm sorry, this court, the Supreme Court has actually said that identification evidence is just evidence like any other and specifically said it doesn't go to the heart of the adversary process. Um, if if you have a situation and this is I, I, I'll reiterate that it's a hypothetical. Absolutely. Because I think it's different from this case. If you have a situation where that particular identification statement, that's the guy is the difference between reasonable doubt and not, or even um, the difference between a harmless error and a non-harmless error, then I, I think that could be dispositive. Why I suggest it's very different in this case is, is for two reasons. Um, the one is we would have probably gone forward with Ms. Peters, even if she couldn't have identified him because she had so much circumstantial evidence identifying her. She had so much testimony that she could give saying, well, 
Are you familiar with his apartment? Yes, it had these teal walls. Here's the layout. It's a one room studio with one door. It's to the, it's to the bathroom. Well, another witness said exactly the same thing. That corroborates the photographs. That's good evidence that they're talking about the same person. Have you seen any other people at that apartment? Yeah, I saw Angela Carpenter. Angela Carpenter, did you see her? Yes. That's pretty strong evidence. We're talking about the same guy. What was his modus operandi? Is it unique? Yes, here's what he did when he was producing child pornography. I mean, these were pretty specific things. She was performing a sex act on him while he paid someone to produce child pornography, which is the same thing he did with Angela Carpenter. All of those details would allow a jury to find with pretty strong confidence that the person Sasha Peters was talking about was the same person Angela Carpenter was talking about, the same person who appeared in images identified by Angela Carpenter that was that were on his phone depicting produced child pornography that they found. So in this case, and it's somewhat unusual because a lot of times there's not circumstantial identity, uh, evidence of identity, but here I think it's very strong. And another factor in this case is even without Ms. Peters' testimony, there would be very, very strong evidence supporting the defendant's guilt. I will touch briefly, I won't belabor the point, but I'll touch briefly on the sentencing issue. There's a very narrow proportionality principle in the Eighth Amendment, and it requires, it, 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 it holds that a sentence only violates the Eighth Amendment if it is grossly disproportionate and excessive when viewed in light of the, all of the conduct for which the defendant is restored, related to the offense. This case doesn't come close to reaching that narrow proportionality principle. This court has held that it's a case that would, a sentence that would, is hen's teeth rare. And certainly a 660 month sentence for someone who's 47 years old is one of the most serious sentences the court can impose. But this conduct in the defenses, the defendant's offenses are among, absolutely among the most serious a person can commit. And the sentence here, although serious, is absolutely proportional. That was a, it was a below uh, uh, guideline sentence, wasn't it? Considerably below guidelines. The guidelines advise 2,040 months. He received 660 months. That's very substantial downward variance. And I, I think that is telling. And it's comparable to sentences that this court has affirmed for conduct that is not, not even close to as heinous as the conduct for which he was held, for which Mr. Ross was held responsible. Um, this court basically established the baseline in, in, in Kogler. We have, we have the Supreme Court case setting out, saying a uh, sentence of life for 600, for distributing 660 some grams of cocaine is not grossly disproportionate. And if the conduct is more heinous, more culpable, it can't meet that. We can't meet even the first part of the proportionality test. And this conduct is objectively worse by a fair margin. So if the court has more questions, I'm happy to answer them. But if not, I will rest on my briefs and yield the balance of my time back to the court. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Uh, Mr. Willis, you have reserved some time. Just like to quickly try to clarify and respond to a point council made about the impermissibly suggestive um, standard that we raised in our brief. When we discussed in our brief, the argument we made about structural error, um, we cited to Turner versus Louisiana Supreme Court case for the proposition that the requirements that a jury's verdict must be based upon the evidence developed at trial. That was essentially our argument that, that why this is structural error in that the trial court identified Mr. Ross, not the witness, that the trial court, I think as we articulated at one point, essentially testified that this is Mr. Ross. Where we raised the Simmons case in response to counsel is in our discussion about plain error. And I think perhaps inartfully, but we raised it to the point that this is, if the court engaged in a plain error analysis, in prong one, that the error is plain, that identification issues um, raise due process concerns. But where I would not concur is that the appropriate analysis for this particular error that occurred 
at trial is the impermissibly suggestive analysis to the point that the government made, made because it implicates typically police misconduct or police procedures. That's not what we're talking about here at all. It's the court identifying the witness or identifying the defendant when the witness could not. Mr. Enright made a, a point that I thought was a, a good one about the other circumstantial evidence that she could have testified to, even if, uh, and I'm talking about Ms. Peters, even if she had not definitively identified Mr. Ross. So, and we go back to the beginning. I mean, there's, this was a case, this was the case of United States versus Ross, right? There's no question that Mr. Ross was who he is. He had witnesses who identified him before Ms. Peters testified. And so, uh, you know, it, it's easy, I suppose, for us to criticize the district court for stating what seemed to him to be the obvious, that's, that's Mr. Ross. Uh, but even if, if, in fact, that was a mistake on the part of the district court, Mr. Enright makes the point that the witness still would have been allowed to testify as to all the things that she saw firsthand that suggested that the same person who handled the phone, the same person who was in the apartment, the same person who produced the child pornography was in fact Mr. Ross, even if she could not identify him. That all suggests to me that um, that this is not really a structural error. It really is something that needs to be gauged against the standard of plain error and or harmlessness. I heard Mr. Enright make that argument, Judge Diaz. I'm just thinking through it practically. I'm not sure how that could occur. At what, I mean, perhaps they could show her photos from the inside of the apartment for her to identify, but when it comes to saying you know, the, the, the still images of the offense conduct or, or other things that or the evidence would be that she participated in with Mr. Ross, I'm not sure how she would be allowed to testify that if she can't, in fact, identify the defendant as the person that was involved in the conduct. I think, was, I think Mr. Willis, it, what, what uh, counsel was saying is that you can connect direct identification with circumstantial evidence because the best thing could have happened to you, I guess, would be she would say clearly, unequivocally, that is not him. But anything short of that, you can do that. You, you can say, all right, you can identify this apartment and that kind of thing, and circumstances, but you can't remember that whether or not that's him. Another person says, yes, that's exactly him. I was there and I saw her there. What are you doing? Just direct identification of him or witness one, witness two identifies circumstances which connects that identification. So that, that's the point I think Mr. Enright was making. That that's got it's it is a difficult argument for me from my my hypothetical, but he brought it down to what because we're looking at what the ifs and could have been and, and obviously, you know, it's uh you make a good point. I can see the defense counsel was saying that seemed like that was too far. But even assuming that, that that's not a knockout for that witness, because there is so much circumstantial evidence that connects other people seeing him, uh, you know, saw him, and testified that was him. I think that's the point. So, but go ahead, make make finish making your arguments. Thank you, Your Honor. Just just briefly, Judge. Again, where the court in this circumstance, identified Mr. Ross, said, Mr. Ross, take down your mask. That is a different kind of error that we argue isn't susceptible to plain error analysis that is structural and would require a new trial. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Willis. Thank you, Mr. Enright, for your arguments. Okay, thank you. We'll come down to Greek Council and proceed to our final case next.
May it please the court, Ann Hester representing James Podbielski. The only issue and dispute here is whether police had reasonable suspicion to justify extending a traffic stop to run a drug investigation. They did not. For starters, Deputy Porter didn't include any of the facts that tend to dispel reasonable suspicion in his, in his analysis. He had a drug dealer profile in mind when he extended the stop, and that was someone traveling from Atlanta, Georgia to sell drugs at Harris Casino. But he ignored multiple facts that completely undercut that profile, including that Highway 441 is one of only two highways in Jackson County, and locals and tourists use that road every day to travel around the county. Podbielski isn't from Atlanta, and Porter had no information connecting him to Atlanta. Podbielski's driver's license was suspended, giving him a traffic-related reason to want to avoid being stopped and to be unusually nervous after Porter ordered him out of the car. His explanation of his travels was consistent with his passengers, Ms. Parton, and Podbielski was staying in a cabin. Were both he and Ms. Parton's licenses suspended? Yes. Both of them? Well, in, in that case, they weren't going to be able to leave in that vehicle, were they? Does that change the analysis of whether the search could have occurred? I don't think it does because the officer was citing him for no officer for no operator's license and it's not clear that he wouldn't have been able to get back into the vehicle. The officer didn't testify to that at all. Um, so the government didn't present any evidence that the, the vehicle would be impounded or any other evidence of inevitable discovery in this case and it is their burden to present that evidence. Um, I think it's also significant that Mr. Podbielski was staying in a cabin in the area and and had been in town for several days, according to the trespass summons at Joint Appendix page 237, which was dated on July 22nd, and this stop was on um, July 25th. Considered in their totality, the circumstances simply don't add up to reasonable suspicion justifying a drug investiga investigation. This is a nervous driver with a suspended license whose passenger had left her fly open after using the bathroom and was uncomfortable making eye contact with the officer, and the stop was in an isolated area in the middle of the night. The facts here just don't eliminate a substantial portion of travelers who are innocent. I know you're process. arguing about the reasonable suspicion and not the fact that it, the stop was prolonged, but how long was the entirety of the stop? Do you know? I think it was, well, before the, the drug dog before the officer came back, I can't tell you the exact number of minutes. It was somewhere around 25 minutes. Um, and if the court wants to talk about that, I mean, the officer, he, he extended the stop in a number of ways, um, beginning with um, searching for unrelated civil matters, child support. He completed, he changed the, the date on a summons, which he didn't have legal authority to do. Um, he took a very long time to fill out the, the citation form. And then um, he spoke to, he took, he said that he took two minutes to speak to the canine officer about his drug investigation. And then even then when he had finished all of the documents and went to talk to Mr. Podbielski, he, he read the entire summonses aloud to him. He said that that was his belief about what he had to do under the law, but that's just not correct. And even then, when Mr. Bos Phil B Podbiski asked, am I free to go, he said no, because he didn't have the answer from the canine sniff yet. So under all those circumstances, the stop was certainly extended beyond the scope of a traffic stop, and the government doesn't really dispute that. And that was going to be my next question. Did the government ever argue um, that it was not unnecessarily prolonged? The, not the in this stop? court. They made that argument in, in the district court, um, you, but they've abandoned it in this court. You pointed out, and correctly, I think that the, and maybe, uh, I think you said this, if you didn't, I'll say it, that the, that the, the law in this case is intended to ferret out, uh, make sure that the, the police are not able to dragnet innocent travelers while, while on the highway. So it, this occurred at about two something in the morning, is that right? That's correct. So I wouldn't think there'd be a lot of traffic on the road at that point in time. Does that factor at all into the analysis? I really don't think it does. I mean, for one thing, there's a 24 hour casino in this county. Um, of course, Mr. Podbielski told the officer and there's no reason to disbelieve that he wasn't he, he wasn't going to or from the casino that night, but also, you know, people work at night 
not everybody has a nine to five job. There's a 24 hour casino. There are businesses to support it, gas stations and things like that. So there is some traffic, but, but also the officer didn't testify that it was unusual to see traffic on the road at night. And in particular, he didn't testify that this was a drug trafficking thoroughfare or that it was it was common to see people drug, trafficking drugs along this highway. You also didn't mention that uh, uh, the officer found it strange that uh, your client uh, slowed down as the officer was passing him and in, instead of um, sort of keeping pace with the, uh, the speed limit on the highway. And how, how would you characterize that behavior, if at all? Well, I mean, I personally don't think that it's strange, but he testified that it was strange. So let's take that at face value. But even then he very quickly found out why Mr. Podbielski had a traffic related reason to not want to be stopped. And that was, is, is that he was driving with a suspended license. So once he had that information, that factor just lost a lot of its juice. And, and furthermore, he didn't testify to any connection between that kind of behavior and specifically a suspicion of drug trafficking. And um, that slowing down and, and his knowledge that Mr. Podbielski was driving with a suspended license also dovetails with his testimony about uh, Mr. Podbielski becoming more nervous after Porter ordered him out of the car and took his driver's license because Podbielski's nervousness increased at the exact moment that he handed over the suspended driver's license to Porter and he didn't tell him it was suspended. He was waiting for them to find that out. So the anticipation of getting in trouble for driving without a license would make anyone nervous, whether they were trafficking in drugs or not. And what's more, this court has repeatedly noticed that it noted that it's normal to be nervous during traffic stops. Now, this is, officer is it normal to be sweating when it's fifty degrees out? Well, this officer did testify that he found him unusually nervous, but the particular circumstances of this stop would make anyone unusually nervous because it is in an isolated area and it's in the middle of the night. The officer testified that there were no houses or businesses in the area and police had just escalated the encounter by having backup arrive, ordering Podbielski out of the car, taking his license and then questioning him about its whereabouts. So in light of all these circumstances, this factor really deserves very little weight. Uh, I'd like to talk about Again, the fact that the vehicle was traveling at night on Highway 441, because this is really a source city argument. Um, but Porter found no evidence connecting Podbielski to Atlanta, which he said was the source city for drugs. But even if he had the cases that this court where this court has relied on a source city as part of reasonable suspicious, reasonable suspiciousness um, had a lot more going on in those cases, such as inconsistent stories about travels a lot of air fresheners um, or a quick trip that's consistent with um, with someone being a drug courier. And again, as I said, this is one of only two highways in the whole county and Porter himself testified that everyone uses this highway all of the time. Can I get you to focus on the, the two pieces of evidence that I thought were fairly important in this analysis and Ms. Enright can probably point to some others, but I mean, uh, and that has to do with the passenger's behavior in the car. And you mentioned this briefly, the fact that she had her fly unzipped and you posited all kinds of innocent and very interesting explanations for why someone would do something like that. Uh, but the officer testified that in his experience, one possible explanation was that she had hidden contraband either inside of her pants or inside of her. And then when you couple that with the fact that he noticed that she kept looking around, looking behind the car, uh, which he testified was suspicious to him because he thought that she might be looking to see if uh, something was hidden there. Why wouldn't a reasonable officer in that case uh, have a heightened suspicion of possible illicit activity on those facts? Well, I want to I, I want to talk about those facts um, one at a time. So I, I, let me start with the fact that she was looking inside the vehicle. He said as if she was making sure something was hid because. I just want to be clear, she was inside the vehicle this whole time. She was not outside the vehicle looking in. And so it's not comparable to what the government suggests, which is Terry, which is people walking by a business and looking from outside in. She's sitting in the vehicle, so she has to look somewhere in the vehicle. Um, the problem with this testimony is that Porter didn't describe what movements Parton made that led him to suspect that she was hiding something. And that, it doesn't give this court the data that it needs to do its job of deciding he whether his... that her pants were unzipped and that was 
that was part of his reasoning. Right. That was part of his reasoning as well. But he also didn't testify about what her eye movements were um, to give this court the data that it needs to. So he basically he said he had a suspicion. He's saying he has a suspicion. She's looking to see if it, she's hidden something. Um, but but this court said in Williams that officers have to apply their experience so that courts can make informed decisions on whether their suspicions are reasonable. And the court applied a similar rule in Drakeford where it refused to rely on the officer's testimony that a handshake was a hand-to-hand -hand drug transaction because the officer didn't provide any details about the handshake that allowed the court to view it as suspicious. So his testimony that she looked like she was making sure something was hidden is, is just as conclusory as the officer's testimony in Drakeford about the handshake. And just like in Drakeford, it prevents the courts from assessing whether for itself whether her movements um, made his suspicion that she was looking to see if she hid something reasonable. Um, he's doing the same thing that the officer in Drakeford did, which is labeling a person as a drug dealer and then viewing all of their actions through that lens. Uh, that's exactly what he did here, and it doesn't support reasonable suspicion. Um, talking about Can the Can you pants, address, oh, go ahead. Pants, You're still yes, answering. Let's talk about the pants. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Leaving pants, I offered all I offered all of those all of that information in the brief just to explain what we all know, which is that leaving your pants unzipped is not something that's unusual. Before I walked in here, I made sure that I had mine zipped. Up. Right. I, I mean, I, I paid so much more attention to the people wearing their pants unzipped on purpose for fashion. Um, <laughs> uh, but probably the most common reason for leaving your pants unzipped is the one reason that Parton gave him, which is that she had gone to the bathroom and she must have forgotten to zip them back up. And did, she, gave, did, she, did she say that? Yes. Mm -hmm. But Porter said he didn't believe her because no businesses were open at that hour to use the restroom. And that explanation for disbelieving her just doesn't make sense. Because first of all, he knew she was a local resident. So she had a home in the area where she could have used the bathroom. He couldn't remember where they said they were traveling from. And he admitted that she could have used the restroom at somebody's house. But that's certainly true, but isn't it equally possible that his his explanation for what happened is was also a, a fact? It's possible, but when you look at the totality of these circumstances, does this, under the totality of these circumstances, does that separate these travelers from- I guess my concern is you're travelers. kind of holding this officer to, to a pretty high burden under, you know, he's got to think he doesn't have a lot of time. We've got the leisure of time here to be thinking here. We got 20 minutes each per side, but the officer doesn't have that amount of time. And he says, in my experience, someone whose fly is unzipped uh, in the past is, is consistent with someone who's trying to hide contraband. I mean, why is that unreasonable? It's a hunch. It's just a hunch. Really? Yeah. It's. I mean, it's just a hunch. What makes her different from uh, someone who's, what, what was it about this stop that distinguished her from the innocent person who had done what she said she did, which is forget to leave her pants unzipped and then feel really nervous as a Native American in the middle of the night in this stop in an isolated area. When did they he know that? That up. she was a Native American? Did he yes, know? he knew she was Native. Okay. Um, Can so, you address the, the fact that the officer's experience at the time of the suppression hearing that he testified about was much different than his experience at the time of the stop? Well, I think it's two year really, difference. Right? I think it's really problematic because he had he was he he had such a small amount of experience to begin with, and half of it took place bef uh, half of it took place after the stop, and because of the way that the prosecutor asked the questions, which specifically directed him to the number of stops that he had undertaken at the time of the hearing. So there's really just no way to parse out his testimony to know what experience he, what judgments he was making at the time of the stop versus what judgments he was making as a post hoc rationalization. Um, and I think that that makes all of his testimony about his experience extremely problem, problematic in this case, because that kind of testimony applied to every single one of the factors that the government has cited here in support of reasonable suspicion. So in conclusion, I would just ask the court to vacate the district court's judgment and reverse the district court's ruling on Mr. Podbielski's suppression motion. Thank you, Ms. Hester. Uh, Mr. Enright. 
Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. I'll introduce myself again. Anthony Enright for the United States. The Fourth Amendment authorized Deputy Porter to extend the traffic stop to Popielski because he had reasonable suspicion that criminal activity was afoot. Um, can, I, can I just get something out of the way? If we don't agree with you on that point, do you concede that the stop was unreasonably prolonged? If there's no reasonable suspicion, then we lose, Your Honor, yes. Okay. I do agree with that. Um, the Deputy Porter testified specifically this was a case where, you know, the standard focus is on the facts known to the officer. And Deputy Porter testified that it was a combination of things that led him to suspect that the uh, occupants were concealing something illegal, likely drugs in the car. Uh, I think there's primarily five factors. Each of these are factors that the officer himself testified contributed to his suspicion. First, Podbielski. Before you get to that, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but absolutely, I, I want you to answer uh, Judge Stacker's question. Is exactly what, what what time period of the officer's experience is relevant here? I mean, there's some uncertainty as to whether or not some of that experience was pre-stop and some was post-stop. Does that matter, or what? How are we supposed to parse that out? So there, the Supreme Court in Ornelas made clear there's two parts to reasonable suspicion. One are the historical facts. Those are the things that need to be known by the officer at the time of the stop to justify reasonable suspicion. The second component is whether the inferences that give rise to suspicion are objectively reasonable. That component is viewed through the lens of an objectively reasonable officer. And that component is not limited in scope because it's an objective standard for this court. I think a court, uh, the, the, an officer can say, this is usual or unusual and inform the court's view of what's objectively reasonable to an officer based on information that he may not have known at the time. And I think the defense brief at least implicitly acknowledges that because it cites maybe 15 or 16 different articles about individuals, about people, about Native Americans, about roads, about the casino, things of that nature that there's nothing to suggest were known to the officer at the time. And that's fairly common. I've, I've seen many, many, many cases where this would come up in almost every case, there's a difference of time between when a, uh, an officer completed a stop and when he testified. And I have never seen a decision that holds that the officer's testimony needs to be excluded or parsed when they say my, my training and experience includes experience in this area. But isn't there a world of difference between a rookie officer first time on the beat and a 20 year veteran veteran in analyzing uh, you know, the, what the officer does or doesn't do? Yes, Your Honor, in this court, the Supreme Court has cautioned repeatedly that this court shouldn't treat them differently. A, a seasoned officer should not have more license to stop people than a, a, an inexperienced officer. And that's why what's, what's relevant, what's, what's subjectively relevant, uh, what the officer must have known are the historical facts. And this court looks at those historical facts the, the officer has to testify about and say, that was, I was aware of that and I considered that. But then this court evaluates them through its own lens and decides whether an objectively reasonable officer would view those as suspicious. So let me give an example about the one fact that I think is particularly favorable to you, and that is his analysis as to what this, what, what the uh, woman was doing in the car uh, with respect to the fly and, the, and hiding contraband. If he, he testified based on his experience that, that that was consistent with somebody trying to hide contraband inside either her pants or inside of her. If that experience had been garnered post-stop, does that matter? Um, possibly, it would be a little bit harder. I wouldn't. I will mention though that he specifically testified multiple times. He had seen that during prior stops, during past stops, and he was asked about that. And there's, I, I suspect, I, I know my. Uh, but we don't know if those past stops were prior to the suppression hearing or prior to the actual stop at issue here, do we? I think his testimony was pretty clear. Had you, he was asked, had you seen examples of people concealing them in their underwear or in their body cavities during past stops? Had you at that time? And if there's any ambiguity, standard of review requires this court to resolve reasonable inferences in our favor because we prevailed below. But I do think the his testimony was pretty clear about that. So. Yes, I do think that's, I, I, I do think, I, I think that's kind of on the bubble because I think that's something this court can say, well, that's an objective fact and I could, I could see how that would be reasonable. Frankly, I think it's a bit, in, I, obviously I disagree with my friend here. I think it's a bit intuitive how that could be. 
the, the brief said we need to explain how pants work, but I think the way someone might be able to conceal drugs on their person may be may not require any kind of special expertise to to draw that inference. Um, that said, I think this court should consider it under any standard because he, the the evidence does support an what inference. What were the that factors you were going to talk about? I think you said there were you were about to mention four or five. I'd say there's five, Your Honor. The first one is Podbielski slowed down from the speed limit of 50 miles an hour to 35 miles an hour. The officer testified, I've never seen anyone slow down that much. And it's significant. We all see somebody slow, they're going a little over the speed limit. They slow down to the speed limit when the officers, when they pass an officer. He was going the speed limit and he slowed down 15 miles an hour to evade the officer getting behind him. And the counsel, didn't the police officer pass him and move in front of him? Yes. All right. Well, and what 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 drew the attention of the officer first was that he touched the line on the right a couple of times and then touched the line on the left, right? Yes. Sir. And then reasonably you might say, maybe that's an impaired driver, right? That's what the officer. Have you ever heard of somebody getting in front of an impaired driver? I mean, that make I mean you think they're in pairs. Well, let me get in front of them and slow down. Oh, well, who would do that? That, that? that doesn't make sense. If anything, you're going to stay behind and say, wait a minute, oh, I'm, I'm going to make sure I know where he or she is going before I get near. The officer got in front of him and slowed down. Now, if a police officer is in front of me and, and he slows down, I'm going to slow down. I think that's a natural citizen's reaction. Yes, Your Honor, I think he testified a little more than that. He, he initially, when he first approached him and saw him cross the fog line once, he then caught up with him to take a better look at him and ended up passing him. At that point, he saw him cross the fog line in his rearview mirror. He changed lanes to the other lane, so he wasn't in front of him, and then slowed down to get behind him, expecting that if he kept going at the same speed, he would get the Podgielski would get in front of him and he would move over. But, but most people don't have, look, look, we can't take leave of our common sense and experiences. Most people do not want to pass police officers, particularly at 2.41 in the morning. If, if he or she goes down to 15, I'm doing 14. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just natural because I've seen people slow down interstate highway traffic for police officers. State troopers coming along. Everybody said, no, you pass him first. No, not me, you, you, you. I mean, it's just, you can't, it's almost like manufacturing a reason to be suspicious. I mean, that's that's the universe to me. I, I, I don't, the reason I disagree with that, Your Honor, is well, go ahead, the, please. Well, the officer testified. He had been, and here it is relevant because he again said never. I have never seen anybody slow down like that. In five years, four, okay, five years, six months he spent as a bailiff, four and a half years at least he'd spent on the road as a, as a trooper. He'd never seen that. And that's, a, 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 I think, a fair example of the kind of thing this court should take into account when deciding whether something's objectively reasonable, because those officers are out of Okay, fair enough. Basis. But as, as, as Ms. Hester said, we now know why he would. And the officer knew. He suspended driving. The, doesn't that further inform what he had never seen before? Now we're talking about somebody slowing down because, whoa, I have a suspended license. I'm really going to make sure I don't pass it. The other way, it's a dynamic. It can't just be, okay, that's what stopped now, but I'm sticking with that. It had to be some legal reason why he did that. Now you have, although it's improper for him to have a suspended license, it's certainly not another offense that's, that he's committing or has committed that would have caused that, right? Well, I heard the, the word certainty isn't isn't the one applicable to reasonable suspicion. Well, I agree. I agree it's not certain, but I, I thought I said it informs what was initially may have thought to be a illegal reason, and it is illegal in the sense of that, and he's going to give him a citation for that. That was the only reason for the stop. I just want to start there before we start talking about justifying extending that reason. Now, then you go to, because his passenger's uh, uh, fly was unzipped, what's, you, what, what's wrong with that? I mean, so you're in the car, you have a, I don't want to say, how is that Ill illegal? If I may, Your Honor, let me break those yeah, break it down for parts me. into two parts. The first part is the stop. The officer testified that he stopped him because he thought he was inebriated. He decided he's going to initiate the stop after he saw him cross both lines and he was in front of him. Then he decided, I'll slow down to get behind him to initiate the blue lights. 
So the, that was the reason for the, the reason for the stop wasn't the slowdown. The slowdown was one of five factors that made him suspicious that he might be carrying drugs. And that, that slowdown did, did he, was... Did the officer actually say that uh, he thought that uh, the defendant was trying to evade him by slowing down? I don't think he did, did he? He didn't testify that it was evasive, but he testified that it was, it made it more, in, 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 as he slowed down, it made him it made it difficult for him to get behind the car. Obviously, he didn't. He said he couldn't see the 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 the, the uh, individuals in the car at the time uh, for the stop. He he didn't know what was in their mind. But the inference you can draw from that is that's evasive conduct. The the second one is when he gets out of the car, and this court has and the the officer was very candid about this. Nervousness is not um, is not a good indicator of of something unusual. Everyone, he, he testified, everyone's nervous during a, um, a traffic stop. But this uh, individual became increasingly nervous as the traffic stop escalated. He already knew he was going to get stopped for that license, as your honor mentioned. And he wasn't, he was nervous, but not above the norm. And then he gets out of the car and he becomes extremely nervous. He's sweating in the high 50s. He, in the court, the, the, the officer identified these objective indicia of nervousness, of enhanced nervousness. It's increasingly nervous, indicating something more than just traffic infractions and just the suspended license. And then the passenger, the passenger's looking in the car as if he's not sure she could be looking outside of the car too, but she's looking inside of the car as if she's concealing something. And her pants are unzipped in a way that the officer's familiar with. People have concealed things in their underwear and in their person this way before. All of those factors combined, not any of them in isolation, give rise to more than an inquit suspicion approach when viewed through the lens of an objectively reasonable officer. And there are these other contextual factors that exist. This court in Drakeford mentioned, you have to look at, it's, it's entirely appropriate for an officer to look at things like, well, what time of day is it? Or are we right under some security cameras? Does, does the suspicion I'm drawing from these factors make sense in this context? That's that's what these factors like, what highway you're on, the fact that they have a relationship to the casino, the fact that they're so from those, New York. The, I'm go, ahead. Go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, no, you go ahead. I just said, what does the casino have to do with it? The casino, it, it, it's simply something that corroborates his suspicion. They The casino, met, it's a business. It's a licensed business. I mean, yeah. Absolutely, Your Honor. And I, the so officer, why, I, I, I'm really serious about this. Why? Because they were they are near the casino. What does that have to do with it? It has it's nothing a, to do with them being near a casino. It okay. has to do with the fact they met at the casino. And so it's simply a corroborating factor that he has experience with the casino, knows a lot of drugs came from Georgia. He didn't know that. He didn't know the defendant was or the uh, uh, appellant was coming from Georgia. He testified he didn't know where appellant. Well, he he couldn't remember. She, he said something, but so let she, me, he couldn't remember. So this is what I wanted to ask you. I just want to get straight that these are the five things that add up to reasonable suspicion as far as the government is concerned. The fact that he slowed down, that he was nervous, that the passenger was looking in the car where she was sitting, that her pants were unzipped because she says she had stopped to use the bathroom, and that they met at the casino. That's it? Those are the... The five factors aren't just the meeting at the casino. I, I, I group those factors under the context of the stop. He was on a highway from Georgia. He was yeah, from he, Georgia. They had a connection to the a casino. A highway that is from Georgia, but he didn't know that the appellant was from Georgia at the time he stopped him. And he, did, he didn't know that. I mean, he didn't know when he, not when, he at the initial the stop, phone. but by the time he called for the drug dog, absolutely. But do, that, how far is that from the, I've been to the area you're talking about. How far is that from the Georgia line? I don't know, Your Honor. It's very close. I don't, I, I think you're right. Yeah, it's very close. Yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> well, you know, it, this is not Europe, you know, it's, it's not a different country when you cross. It's still the United States. I mean, what difference does it make from Georgia? I'm, I'm sure a lot of Ohio people are near Huntington. I mean, it's a river right across the Ohio, right across the Kentucky, and I mean, Ohio, you know, Kentucky. I mean, what, what that's, how is that suspicious? It's not, Your Honor. It's not suspicious. Okay, so, so, not... so okay, okay. Well, you can see then a license plate in Georgia is not correct. Not in isolation. And what? and so 
you saying a person who has pants unzipped who told the officer I just used the bathroom I forgot to zip my my uh, zipper and I, I don't think there are many males particularly who could say that they've never forgotten to do that I mean so and so and, and the other he said he they, they, they didn't pass him when he slowed down they didn't pass him and so that means you could extend the stop until you got a canine unit there to sniff around their car. With that, that's a whole lot of people you could stop and make them wait until you get a canine union. union. I don't think so, Your Honor. The court, I think the court got it right when it held that, that those factors exclude the vast majority or the majority of innocent travelers. Well, the court never held that because it never reached it. It didn't address, it, it, it did, it specifically credited the officer's testimony to that effect when describing the facts. So. This court can defer to that, and if 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 it were, if, if if that were a blank, then it would draw the inference in favor of the United States under the standard of review. But I, I think it was correct because an, a, an unusual, it's very unusual for someone to slow down from the speed limit, fifteen miles an hour. It's very unusual for someone to exhibit the escalating signs of nervousness that this particular defendant did. That it was an un, it was to use the words of this court, nervousness beyond the norm. It is very unusual. It's not, uh, it, it was consistent with and unusual. It was unusual and consistent with what he had seen drug traffickers do before. What was the speed limit? 50 miles an hour. How much? 50 miles an right. hour. 50, and the officer slowed down to 15, right? I believe he slowed down to 35 before he was able to get behind the, or the, the, the Podbielski slowed down to 35 before the officer was able to get behind him. Slowed down to 35? Yes, Your Honor. And that was unusual. The officer testified he'd never seen, and he'd seen people slow down in the police presence often, but never to that degree. What do you think the minimum speed limit was? I don't know if there was a, I, there's no testimony about it, and I really have no idea. So, in other words, this was legal conduct? Your Honor, every single thing the officer, the, 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 they did that gave rise to reasonable suspicion was legal, like it, like it is in most cases, like it was in Wardlaw, like it was in Terry. But the combination gave the officer reason to suspect that criminal activity may be afoot. And the, 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 we're talking about what's reasonably necessary to detain someone very briefly to investigate further. Not, not anything close to probable cause, not anything close to a preponderance of the evidence, just objective facts that evince more than an inchoate suspicion or hunch, sufficient to warrant reasonably detaining the officer, the, the individuals to investigate. Further. You would agree you can't uh, uh, rely upon in, inevitable discovery in this case under these facts. You agree with that? I agree with that, Your Honor. Okay. If this court um, has any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. If not, don't have much time left, but I will yield it back to the court. Thank you, Mr. Inmate. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Ms. Hester, you have some time reserved. I wanted to start um, with the question of the zipper and the officer's testimony about it, whether he was testifying to his experience at the time of the hearing or two years before at the time of the stop. And actually, the, the prosecutor asked him, past tense, had you encountered in individuals during past stops, male or female, where they concealed drugs on their person, such as in their underwear, where, but the officer tes testifies, yes, sir, I sure have, present tense, that's on page 88. And the same thing happens on page 89. Had you ever previously encountered a female who would conceal drugs inside her vagina? The uh, officer answers, yes, sure, sir, I sure have, present tense. Um, <clears throat> I also want to point out a comparison between the zipper factor and a factor that took place in the Bowman case, where there the officer thought it was suspicious that Mr. Bowman was, it told him that he was buying multiple cars off Craigslist because the officer says drug dealers often use multiple cars. And this court says, no, you can't do that because a far greater number of innocent travelers also use multiple vehicles and buy vehicles off Craigslist. Well, that same kind of reasoning applies here because the vast majority of people <clears throat> riding in cars with their pants unzipped have nothing to do with drug trafficking. <clears throat> 
Um, I also want to talk about nervousness because I think the court should be wary of using even extreme unusual nervousness as a factor um, without taking into consideration the totality of the circumstances facing a person at the time. Because, because of the news, we all are more and more nervous about traffic stops, whoever we are. And the officer didn't testify that Mr. Podbielski was more nervous than drivers he stopped with a suspended license. He didn't particularize it to that kind of, uh, of a stop. Um, but also I think that the court should seriously take into consideration this isolated area and what the officers were doing at the time that caused the, the driver and the passenger's nervousness to get amped up um, by having an yet another officer drive up. So it's night, there's blue lights flashing. They order the driver out of the car, start questioning him. I mean, that kind of intensifying of a stop would make anyone nervous. It would make me nervous. Um, and I think the court has to take that into consideration when it's considering what the officer says is unusual nervousness, what the officers were actually doing at the time that would make the people in the stop feel more and more uncomfortable about what was happening. That's all I have if the court doesn't have more questions. All right. Thank, thank you. Ms. Thank you, Ms. Hester. And thank you, Mr. Enright, for your arguments. We ask the clerk to adjourn the court, Sandy Dye, and we'll come down to Greek Council. Sonoma Court stands adjourned. Sonny Dye. God